that uh, children's story was a little deep for some of the bigger ones or the smaller ones we've had today. But generally, we have a lot of big children. Yes. But we didn't have so many today. So, anyways, you know, I don't think we challenge our children enough today. And I think challenging them is a good thing. Because that's how they learn. Their little minds are like sponges because they're not so filled up with all this prejudice that we have and all this life experience that, that causes us to think things that we shouldn't be thinking. We're not clean and fresh and new like their young minds, ready to be molded, which is what Jesus is trying to get us to be. Right? So we should be more like children. He even says that. Anyway. I sit on the board, okay, at this church, love this church. There is an element sometimes that wants to streamline the service. And, and as you can see, the pastor is just getting up here to speak at 1147. I'm not condemning anybody, and I'm not saying, listen, you, you don't have a better friend that sits on the board to fight for praises and concerns. But sometimes they go on a little bit, and, and I'm okay with that. I don't care. This is Sabbath. I got nowhere to go, brothers and sisters. This is the best day of the week. I'm here to celebrate Jesus. But I just want you all to know that if that goes on, then the, then the preacher's going to take you into time a little bit further down the road. And if y'all are good with that, I'm, I'm really good with that. But there is an element that always wants to streamline everything. So you just have to keep that in mind. Okay? Not condemning anybody. I certainly am not. Because, whoo. I'm a bad hombre. The Lord's working on me every day. Before my feet hit the floor, I'm, I'm ready to sin. I really am. This, this guy's a bad fellow. And uh, he needs to be done away with. And by God's grace, I'm not what I used to be. How's the rest of it go, Ricky? <laughs> All right. Now, this, this, this little talk is called Out of Balance. Hashtag for the young people, world gone mad. Crazy, right? God loves perfect order, doesn't he? I mean, we're talking about a God. If you ever studied in Isaiah, it talks about his throne. His throne and, it, and how it moves and its wheels turning inside wheels. God can just, it's so much precision and design that it's mind-blowing. We are just beginning to be able to look at things in, in a more molecular level, even deeper and deeper, and the more we look into it, the, the more we see there's divine creation here. This, this thing just didn't come, this didn't just happen, right? Everything was created with perfect design. And, and everything is spinning and moving. God's throne, the universe, the world. You ever stop and think about how all that is moving and it, and it doesn't just tip over? It doesn't break, you know? I mean, we in this world we have bearings that need to be greased and they wear out. And, and they wear out in no time. How long has this world been spinning around? Perfectly. You ever stop to think if it just slowed down for a second, what would happen? The building would fall <coughs> flat on its face. Who, who do you think keeps all that together? You're darn right, it's God. But you know, we got we got a, a world of people that, that think they know better. That think that, that we can somehow solve our problems. We can't solve our problems. Only Jesus can solve our problems. Okay? And, and we can fight and talk about symptoms, but that's all they are. They're symptoms. Because if we have the relationship with Jesus Christ that he's calling us to have, everything will be made right. It'll all fall perfectly in line. Let's get into this. Children and parents. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment of the promise. You know, they always say that the first four commandments point to God and the last six point to man, right? You can't get the last six right, they say, unless you got the first four right. 
But really, the fifth is divided in such a perfect place. And I think it goes to God, too, because isn't God the Father of us all? Isn't He the Creator? Even the Decalogue, everything the way it's put together is so perfect. Who, who could dream this stuff up? Ten principles for happy living. I mean, people call them guardrails, whatever you want to say. But how could you make it so simple? I'm just amazed by God's word. I truly am. In verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. How, how would we provoke our children? Any ideas? Stopping them from doing something they want to do. Okay. Anything else? Pressing, pressing them, pushing them, maybe. Even something I'm guilty of, maybe picking on them. Teasing. Maybe in a playful way, but maybe that's not a good thing, huh? Abuse? Yes. Any more? Does God our Father provoke us? Does he show us the way and say, this is the way walk ye in? Does he make you do that? Does he whip you when you make a wrong turn? Hmm, interesting. What do we do? How do we raise our children? What do we tell them? Well, if you do right, you'd be loved, right? You'd be good. Huh? Huh. Just a thought. Servants, number five. No, well, you know what? Better yet, let's go to 2 Timothy. Just turn your Bible a little bit to the right. Just a very little bit to the right. 2 Timothy. And verse 3. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 1. Sorry. I have a heading on my Bible that says the last time. Perilous times and perilous men. Okay. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, and unholy. Hmm. Do we have that today? Oh, yes. Disobedient. That word disobedient in Strong's is 545. Okay? 545. You know what 545 is? Page number. It means unpersuadable. Unpersuadable. There is, a, there is a disobedience that's just unbelieving, right? That's 544. But 545 is unpersuadable. What does that mean? What does that mean if somebody is unpersuadable? You try to talk to them, but they don't listen. They don't listen. Stubborn? Stubborn. Stubborn isn't always a bad thing. It can be a strength. But it also can be the person's biggest weakness, right? So, doesn't the Bible talk about the unpardonable sin? What is the unpardonable sin? Unbelief. Unbelief. You know, the Holy Spirit never gives up. He never stops. We have to practically beat the Holy Spirit away from us. That's what we say it's easier to be saved than it is to be lost because you have to continually push him away and push him away. But there's going to come a time where everybody's made their decision. Okay? And they can't be moved. God's looking for a people 
that has made that decision for Jesus Christ. There's going to come a time where, like we see in the book of Job, and this interplay goes on between God and Satan, and he says, have you seen my man Job? There's none like him on the earth. There's also going to be a people like Job that God can say, that he can put his name on, that he can write his character on, that he can say these people are not going to be moved. Are we that people? Do we desire to be that people? How do we become that people? Do we realize that the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, it is a man? Okay? Jesus is the light. He is the truth. He is the way. You know, people study their Bibles like a novel. Okay? Jesus, it, the, the, a, a map will, will show you your way. But Jesus is the destination, brothers and sisters. You follow what I'm saying? If you travel a road enough times, pretty soon you get to know the road, don't you? What, what is the purpose of this man? Guide us on our way to heaven. Right. To bring us into right relationship with Jesus Christ. These are 66 love letters that he's written to us to show us himself. Even the, the very last book of the Bible is called Revelation. Who's it the revelation of? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. From the book of Genesis to the very end. Let's go back to Ephesians 6. The beginning in verse 5. Y'all there? Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of, of your heart as unto Christ. We look as servants today as a, as a bad connotation, as slaves, right? But that's who we are in Jesus Christ. We're slaves to Jesus Christ. You're either the slave to Him or you're a slave to the enemy. You know, slaves in the Old Testament, it wasn't a horrible thing. You know, there were slaves that had really good standing. They had, they were treated well. Okay? We have a terrible connotation of it. I had the opportunity on this trip to meet an individual that was very, how can I say, um, bigoted, very, maybe rough, said some things that were pretty cruel. But you know, God allowed me to stand there and listen to this man for a few moments and just love him through all that garbage that he was spewing. Because I'm a type of individual that I'm a pretty rough judge, you know, me and myself. I'm just like black and white, as you said. You know? And uh, there's, there's really not too much middle ground with me, you know, and people seem to think that, that sometimes I'm a little rough because I'm forward. Some people see me as forward, but you never have to guess where you stand with me. I mean, I'd certainly rather have somebody tell me the truth, even if I don't want to hear it. And uh, sometimes they do. <laughs> you know? But God gave me a moment with this man that I was able to just love on him through all that garbage and, and I was able to steer the conversation once he was done I mean I didn't I couldn't get in the middle of that you know it had to go run its course but after it did then I was able to talk to him and I was even able to give him a track of the great love of Jesus Christ that, that my friend had uh, designed and made but, uh, and he read a little bit of it and he gave it back to me. And 
he said he doesn't serve, he doesn't bow to anyone. Okay? And I said, okay. At that moment, I had to leave it where it was. Um, I hope and have the opportunity, God willing, I'm praying for this man that I will see him again and be able to talk some more. And hopefully that wasn't the right moment to push or to force. God is doing a work in me, and I'm so thankful because uh, he allowed me to see something that I haven't been able to see. You know, because if I'm so busy, hard, and judging people, because they don't think like I do, then how can I hear somebody's real heart? You know what I'm saying? How can I really truly love someone if I'm judging? Right? And I'm saying that to say the fact that there's people that God has put in our lives as an authority, maybe even a police figure, okay? And these people are human. They make mistakes. They do things wrong. But we are subject, through the Bible, God says, we are subject to authority, aren't we? I mean, even if somebody is abusing their authority, if we respect authority, for the most part, things go well with us. I'm not telling people to do something that, that is wrong in any way. We are to obey our mothers and fathers, the Bible says. But if it goes against what God says, then we don't do it, right? It's that simple. There is a line to draw, but we are subject to authority, and I think it would do well if we obeyed. It's pretty simple. You know, the reason a lot that, that there's so much chaos in the world, and you know, I, I just stopped listening to it. I really have. I mean, I catch some of the garbage that's going on because people talk, and I talk with people, but I, I, I don't listen to it. I don't watch it. I stay away from it because it's depressing. And people that come up to me and they tell me about all these things that are going on in the world, I tell them, why do you bother? Tune this stuff out. I tune it off. What's it going to do for you? Does it make you happier? Does it make, it make you healthier? Does it bring you in right relationship with God? I don't think so. I don't know. So anyways, back to Ephesians 6 halfway into five, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as man pleasers, but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whosoever, that whatsoever good thing any man doeth the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And ye masters do the same things unto them for forbearing, threatening, tr or treating, knowing that your master also is in heaven. Neither is there respect of any persons with him. What does that mean? There's no respect of persons in him. They're equal than God's not a harsh judge, is he? He does. And sin is sin, isn't it? Now, some of us look at sin as one sin's worse than the other. Well, my brother's sin, that's pretty bad. And the sin I do, that's, that's, that's okay. Right? Is that the way we look at it? Is that the way God sees it? You know, there was Cain and Abel, right? Cain brought a certain sacrifice, and Abel brought a certain, a certain sacrifice. God was displeased with Cain's sacrifice, wasn't he? Did God have a right to be upset with Cain's sacrifice? Did Cain have a right to be upset about the fact that God didn't accept his sacrifice? Hmm. Jesus says, I am the way, right? The truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. What did that sacrifice <laughs> represent? Abel's. Jesus Christ. What did Cain's sacrifice represent? Works. Works. 
Let's, let's turn our Bibles to Revelation 3. come to understand this is something I think is totally wonderful when we can come to understand how totally we are dependent on God on Jesus for everything that we have nothing 
that we can do. We're 100% in every situation dependent on God. We can let things go. Yes. How can I be offended if I'm a dead man? Dead men can't be offended. Okay? The old Ray, and I'm not saying I've arrived anywhere, brothers and sisters. You know, that, that God's preaching to me too. Okay? That was an amazing experience. I don't, I don't think I, I can even get the words across of what God was doing in my heart at that moment. At that moment, he said, Ray, this is you, brother. This is you. I mean, this is you just a few years ago. And I was able to hear that man's heart and see past all that garbage. I often wonder how God deals with all this garbage because that's what he must see, what he allowed me to see in that little teeny, weensy little bit that I saw. He sees in all of you what you can be in him. And it shines so that it will cause this world to be just tipped over. Just the same way Jesus tipped it over. He stayed the tide, the tide of evil. The, the gospel, the Bible says, went to the whole world. Once already. There's people saying, oh, that's all we got to do is just get the gospel to them guys that have never heard about Jesus out there in a forest somewhere. And that Jesus is going to come. We know as Adventists, that ain't the truth, is it? The problem is, is the fact that we as Adventists have been duped in trying to open a door in the sanctuary that is shut, that God says no man can open. And we're not willing to walk through the door that God says is open and no man can shut. It's the devil that's busy at this business trying to shut doors and open doors that nobody can open. God won't allow it. So why don't we follow Jesus into the most holy apartment of the sanctuary and do this work that he has us for us to do and be in agreement about what he says about us. That's the only way this thing's going to be finished, brothers and sisters. Amen. The only way. Revelation 3 and 19. This is a very important part of this whole talk that God is giving in, in, in the way of the seed of if you're there to say amen. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. See, if we listen intently to what God's saying, we can be in agreement with Him. And if we're in agreement with Him, what is it going to cause us to do? It's going to cause us to do the works of very God. Because He's going to be so alive in us. He's actually going to have a people that he can say, ha ha, there they are. I'm going. I can't wait any longer. I can't wait any longer. Behold, I stand at the door, verse 20, and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and then sat down with my father in his throne. Did, did, is Jesus here asking us to do anything that he hasn't himself done? Did he have any advantage that I don't have? He did, but he never used it. He did, but he never used it. It would have disqualified him. Right? Let's turn our Bibles to Colossians. Colossians 1. Colossians 1 and verse 10. Y'all there? That you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of this inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power... Is, do you hear? What tense is that? Hath delivered. Past tense. 
Okay, so this is a done deal, right? These qualifiers are so important to understanding what we're reading. He says it's done. Do we believe it? 